good enough okay great so uh, hello everyone around the world a uh, good morning afternoon and evening wherever you are located and today uh, uh, we'll be presenting our thoughts on sizing variable devices and using function point and snap methodology so uh, what we'll be looking at in this uh, presentation we'll be looking at the variable devices their background growth categories and the communication model they have uh, applicability of uh, function point analysis guidelines and rules in those devices looking beyond the function point world and as in like uh, the snap approach to size the non functional requirements we'll also look into the other sizing challenges uh, the metric questions we have and the road ahead uh, with the conclusion mm -hmm. okay so i'm Okay, so uh, first of all, like, uh, what are the variable devices? To answer this question, just stop and look around yourself. People are using so many types of variable devices right now, uh, like health and fitness tracker, wireless phones. Uh, we have smart running shoes, smart eyeglasses. We have smart watches, uh, virtual reality headsets, and much more. Name you name them, everything is there in the variable devices. these variable devices uh, technology is ever growing and it has already become a part of our life life just like any other android device we have technology wise these devices comes with inbuilt electronic sensors which seamlessly track and collect information in real time world these devices are comfortably worn on our body looking at looking at the challenges the main challenge is to meaningfully impact the users keeping into consideration the security aspects so this is because of the fact that there is a huge amount of data involved in these variable devices they keep on capturing the data through your body sensors and they keep on transmitting it to companion apps to the third party apps so there is a lot of data involved and pri privacy is an issue there uh, the an another challenge is uh, in the software part and in the like device part is that that uh, these devices have limited display area in compared to like like say a smartphone these devices have a limited display area they have a limited computing power that's why they take the data and uh, pass it on or sync it sync it to the companion apps where the aggregation and analysis is done uh, limited uh, memory limited battery size non conventional shape of these devices to fit our body uh, complex sensor model communication these are the other challenges which we see in these devices so uh, let's look into uh, briefly into the history of these variable devices and the uh, growth uh, prospects so i must say that the growth has been really exponential in this area one early piece of widely adopted pre modern wearable technology was the calculator watch that was introduced in uh, 1970s and even earlier uh, wearable device was the hearing aid uh, then the fitbit that came uh, and released their first step counter in 2008 Samsung followed up with their Galaxy Wear in 2013. Apple Watch followed up in 2016. We see uh, HTC releasing their virtual reality headsets to allow users moving freely in the virtual world. Uh, even in 2014 and 15, we have a smart shoe which was launched in Hyderabad, India, and that shoe uh, was connected to a smartphone which was using Google Maps, and they vibrate to tell the users when and where to turn to reach the destination. Wow. Uh, we also see uh, the UV Sense smart swimsuit. This uh, swimsuit uh, has sensors. They alert the users via smartphone to get out of sun or apply sunscreen uh, whenever uh, UV light is above threshold. So you see that how many areas they are expanding. The wearable uh, devices are expanding to unlimited uh, areas, and uh, we see the market cap as well. Just look at the market cap from past five years. uh the uh, revenue has nearly doubled so in 2020 according to a survey of us consumer technology sales and forecast uh, uh the uh, the 2020 market is uh, for wearable devices is 10000 million dollars wow and uh, most of it comprises of smart watches we also have health and fitness technology vr ar uh, devices and the sports technology uh mainly uh, like we also know that a us military uses uh, halogen uh, in their uh, uh, in the uniform that is also based on the wearable device concept technology so we see certain categories and i have already mentioned these categories in the uh, like earlier slides that with what all types of devices are there in uh, in in this world we have smart watches we have fitness tracker uh, the virtual reality headsets we saw uh, 
smart watches for uh, sports personnel we have smart jewelry which are uh, specially targeting the women so that they can wear those jewelry and keep track of their uh, like health and uh, other stuff like that we have even implant table devices which are surgically implanted uh, inside the skin of a patient and these track the con uh, contraceptions and insulin levels so you see that these devices are like everywhere and the like um, uh, the world is just uh, small for these devices Hello everyone. I am Sushmita. As Saurabh aptly introduced, wearable devices is a very vast area, and our focus is on the function point analysis. In order to limit the possibilities to a workable volume, we have taken Fitbit devices as example and approached the sizing problem. Platform architecture we see here helps us understand the communication model for Fitbit. devices and also can be generalized for other wearable devices next uh, yeah most of us here we already know what function points are uh, so i i don't intend to uh, spend much time on this function point is a method to quantify the software functionality uh, by sizing it with the basis of uh, functional requirements it is independent of technology language used or platform used to build the software solution uh, when we talk about fp we mean if pug variant uh, in this uh, presentation let's take a look at a slightly different uh, uh, communication model representation here we have a fitbit device which is uh, having its own sensors to sense the data and parameters uh, events from the environment it uh, it could be heart rate sensors or motion sensors and store the to store the data it has limited storage in it it can communicate to companion device uh, using bluetooth and the companion device generally hosts companion applications which has storage again it can manage the interactions it can store the user data into the cloud uh, cloud in turn can share the data with third party applications to enhance the usage of data uh, for example third party applications like uh, insurance or uh, healthcare applications can get the get benefited by fitbit data through uh, certain apis exposed and uh, these kind of opportunities are limitless uh from function point perspective we are uh, interested in the applications and in this scenario we see two types of application one set of application will be hosted on the fitbit device uh, they will run on the device and there are certain uh, second uh, class of application which run on the companion device uh when we have different types of application uh, the question is how do we decide on boundary so in function point uh, the purpose of sizing that decides what is the scope of uh, function point sizing and also it helps us how to identify uh, the different boundaries that we have our consideration is uh, fitbit apps should be treated as different boundary compared to the companion apps and the companion apps uh, may come in uh, web version as well as on the mobile phone version such uh, variations we do not consider generally as a different boundary uh, because most of the functionalities supported by these apps are same uh, another uh, consideration is uh, Uh, about the applications running on the fitbit device uh, fitbit device generally have in independent applications uh, installed so, such as spotify could be there exercise applications weather applications so all these have their own independent purpose so we identify these independent applications as different boundaries uh then is, there is another aspect uh, for the fitbit device there are something called clock faces clock faces are nothing but um, home screens and generally different vendors bundle multiple uh, uh, 
clock faces and uh, deliver it so when we have a complete bundle of clock faces we have to club it into one application boundary if there are two vendors who are uh, delivering different bundles of clock faces we would like to uh, classify them as different boundaries because two different vendors may be using different technology different methodology and uh, uh, tools to implement those so it will not be comparable if we merge everything together as a single boundary so however these considerations are not thumb rules uh, case by case depending on the purpose you will have to uh, analyze it and come up with the apt boundary placement so uh, uh, thanks to shunta for uh, analyzing the boundary now the second step uh, is to look at the data functions and, uh, as per if uh, manual the data functions are either ilfs which are uh, user recognizable data maintained within the boundary of the application being measured or they are the external interface files which are user recognizable data maintained in external application but referenced by the application being measured to identify data functions in wearable devices we must consider how the data is tracked how it is collected where it is stored what are the resultant data post analysis post data aggregation what boundaries we have already defined and uh, we try to logically group the related data to decide the data functions we must also consider the nature of wearable devices in the sense that uh, these devices usually have limited memory so what they do is that they sync their data in the companion apps and uh, uh, mostly after 5 to 7 days they uh, delete the data in their uh, like uh, like fitbit will re remove the data after 5 to 7 days and that data will be there uh, for the analysis in the companion app so uh, one hint uh, to look into the data function is to look at the user manual or the device manual so where generally they mention that what data is stored in the device and what data is stored in the cloud Uh, also uh, we should also talk to if possible the application experts the developers the bas architects and try to understand the db schema try to understand the interfaces integrations so those type of things uh, we need to uh, understand and uh, apply the ifpa guidelines to identify the functions and uh, uh, in the next two three slides what we did is that we uh, uh, read through the uh, user manual and the uh, application manual available in the uh, in the open market for fitbit devices we try to figure out what types of data we can uh, uh, logically relate to we can logically classify to and uh, based on the fact that uh, we are considering fitbit app as a separate application and companion app as a separate application we try to map those types of data into ilf and eif for fitbit application or for the companion app so like you see in this particular uh, like uh, example so i'll not go through each and every data types but uh, let's see the biometric information So these contains the health-related data, heart rate, uh, the weight, the calories burned, uh, the number of steps taken. So these all type of biometric information are stored both in Fitbit app as well as the companion app. And using the uh, concepts, we can probably uh, uh, like um, uh, identify the, them as multiple uh, logical groups of data, multiple ILFs in both Fitbit app and the companion app. Uh, we also have some technical data uh, like uh, what operating system this application um, works on the cookie information uh, which ip address the device belongs to the language local language it supports or the, or the browser type it supports so these type of information are technical in nature they are not counted in function point however we will consider them under this snap model which we will be taking in subsequent coming slides we shall also look at uh, some of the other types of data we have a uh, payment uh, details which usually resides under uh, under the bank application which we refer to during the process someone wants to make the payment using the wearable device they will refer the bank uh, payment details and hence we consider them as an external interface for our application uh, we have inferences data these are the type of data are are the analyzed data or the inference data like uh, uh, like calorie number of calories you burned in a week or the average uh, sleep time you had so this type of in information also gets stored in the uh, uh, companion app and we consider them as a separate uh, logical file uh, we have a lot of interactions with uh, various vendors and partners uh, but here we need to identify whether we interact them in our processes or we 
store the data from uh, those vendors and use it in our uh, processes. So uh, need to need, need like case to case basis, it could be either an ILF if we are storing and maintaining those data, or it could be an EIF if we are only referring those data which resides under the vendor. Um, the legal data or the static text and sometimes the security information like masked or encrypted SPI data, these all are typically technical uh, data which we will cover under this SNAP model. All right. So after we have seen the data functions, now we come to the transaction function. If Pug identifies three types of transactions, uh, that is uh, EI, EQ, and EO, uh, we all know that. A certain consideration that we have to be careful about is there will be on-screen transactions, there will be off-the-screen transaction between different devices, different applications, maybe cloud. There are a lot of APIs uh, that uh, these devices use uh, to communicate with each other. So we will have to give the right consideration, apply the IFPAG rules, and identify the transactions. Uh, next. So, um, in, in the case of uh, variable devices, we may find uh, dif uh, documents from different sources. So we may find some sequence diagrams or data flow diagrams representing the API interactions, how they function inside the uh, Fitbit devices uh, in, in uh, such manner. So we can identify transactions from them. Uh, let's take a look at here. Uh, here uh, there are uh, motion sensors which sense the movement and uh, provide the data to the Fitbit engine which uh, analyzes the data, uh, synthesizes the step count and stores it in the local storage. Such transaction can easily be identified as external input. And API signature will give us the number of deities and the, what is the purpose of this flow and uh, the data files that we have for this uh, application will provide us the information of what FTRs to be used. So on the similar basis, we can count saving of the heart rate. So this is also an another EI. So uh, applications that, uh, just a minute, sort of. Applications that are uh, running uh, on the device uh, can access the local storage and uh, display the step count, for example. Such transactions can be seen as a outbound. Uh, here, uh, showing of the step count is counted as one EQ with the two DTs and one FTR. The, okay, we can go. Okay, uh, another uh, way to identify transaction function is through the screen and uh, analyzing the user interactions uh, behind them. So here we take a look at the Spotify app on the Fitbit device. Spotify app has a capability to display the number of devices uh, this Fitbit can be paired with. Once a device is uh, selected, it plays a selected song on the companion device. And all the uh, Spotify app does is to send the play, pause commands to the device it is paired with. So showing of the device in this case can be treated as a EQ and uh, Playing the song on the companion device can be treated as an EO. Uh, this is treated as an EO because the purpose of this transaction is to, is to send the command out to the companion device and the play the song there. It also has some on-screen deities and we can count them all. And in addition, we have to count the communication deities uh, that sends the command to the paired device. So. That is how we approach this uh, interaction. So we, we should be very careful when devices are communicating that communication DETs also play a role in the number of DETs that we need to size. Here we see a set of transactions from the companion app. Companion app is much more powerful than the Fitbit apps. Fitbit apps are very limited in terms of screen space and the amount of information it can display. On the other hand, uh, the companion app can show a dashboard with all the parameters related to the user. Uh, in addition, it will support functionalities like uh, weight, go weight goals, maintaining of the weight goal, tracking of them. It also shows uh, 
daily and weekly trends of various parameters it can also track food and water intake so all these transactions can be analyzed from ifpa perspective uh, apply the rule classify the transaction function whether it is an inbound or outbound and count the det based on the uh, screen plus interaction that it might have with other devices <coughs> And uh, by the way, we have certain examples uh, like counted for transaction and data functions, and uh, we have put it in the backup slides. Uh, in the interest of time, we are not covering in this presentation, but when it will be shared, we can look into this. Okay. So uh, till now, we talked about uh, the uh, function point applicability in the variable devices. But what's left now? Uh, did we cover the security requ requirements, the protocol used, uh, various platforms it uh, supports, uh, the clock faces, there are multiple clock faces which provides the same functionality. So did we cover all those things? I guess no. So uh, the answer is that uh, if PUC has its own uh, 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 method, that is the software non-functional assessment process or SNAP, and when I say non-functional, it is uh, it's technical uh, aspect which I'm talking about. So a requirement can be either uh, broken down into functional requirements or the technical requirements. The functional requirements are covered under the function point model, which we just saw. The non-functional or technical uh, requirements are covered under this SNAP model. And uh, uh, like we see that in uh, like modern world where, where we have digital, uh, AI, ML, microservices, robotics, we have so many things and there are multiple things which get gets, uh, somehow missed in the function point model. I, I, I won't say it gets missed, but I would say that uh, uh, they are not properly uh, correlated with the efforts required to, count, uh, to uh, size them. So uh, if uh, came up with this uh, approach, this is the, uh, a newer approach, but uh, the basic idea behind it is that uh, we have SNAP model, which contains four categories and 14 subcategories. I'll not go down into uh, details of those categories and subcategories, but here we should uh, keep in mind that uh, almost all of the uh, technical requirements can fit in one or the other category or subcategories. And that model is again evolving. If we have some uh, things which are not considered, probably it, it will be done. So if uh, is uh, like evolving SNAP model to counter the function point, uh, I won't say counter, but complement the function point model. And uh, let's see like uh, what all things uh, in this uh, uh, variable devices we saw can be covered under, uh, co covered with SNAP. So uh, we know that uh, these variable devices contain uh, like tracks a lot of data, the heart rate, the step counts, the BP, all those things they take in, take in and then they have multiple huge uh, calculations involved. They have algorithms which uh, translate those data into meaningful information. So those type of complex calculation or uh, extensive mathematical operations or logical inter inferences are considered under 1.2 subcategory of uh, SNAP. Uh, we see data, internal data movement within the uh, variable devices. Uh, we, uh, we, ha we see uh, aesthetic changes like look and feel changes, font changes, color changes, date format changes without uh, adding a, a basic functionality to the, to the device. We have help methods. Uh, the sensitive personal uh, information which we earlier saw, uh, encryption and decryption of those security related things are there. Uh, then we say that uh, the same app is being supported under in, in the mobile as well as in web version. So all these things are taken care under various subcategories of SNAP. A one dot two is logical mathematical operations, internal data movement, uh, database technology, help methods, user interfaces, data formatting, and multiple platforms. So not going uh, into details of them, just looking at uh, two examples, again, on a very high level. So this session is basically to cover, uh, to like, uh, reach out to the audiences and tell everyone that uh, this model is taking care of the other aspects and function point plus snap can be applicable to everything. Like all the newer generation technologies, methodologies will uh, be covered via these two models. Um, if you look at the user interfaces, uh, there are requirements when uh, some of the users want uh, uh, the, the clock face in a uh, brighter format uh, or bright colors. Some, some of them want uh, a bigger font. Some want uh, the date in a particular format. Some want uh, like some other features in the clock display. Uh, so those can be considered as an user interfaces and considered counted under the SNAP model. 
similarly uh, the function point do not take into consideration the internal data movement so once the data is stored from the sensors uh, they are moved to the companion app those are those will be these uh, will be counted under function point but what happens to the data moving between the applications like the sensors collecting the data and moving to the bluetooth uh, communicator device and these type of communications can be counted under the internal data movement uh, uh, subcategory of snap so uh, i myself uh, am in the snap committee and uh, if there are any queries regarding to snap model we are uh, very happy to take it but not uh, probably not here maybe offline we can take because i know there would be many so that's what uh, snap is coming to challenges when we uh, approach this problem there were certain challenges that we faced one was from the documentation there is no formal documentation that was available in the public domain as this is the approach that we were trying on the documentation side uh, in the, from the public available information it was a little difficult another problem that we faced was um, identifying what was technical versus what is uh, business data uh, for example time stamps or uh, device id that we generally with the general purpose uh, softwares we consider them as technical but in these scenarios they become very important uh, dets and they have to be sized uh, next Okay. So, coming to the productivity of uh, uh, variable device applications, they are very small applications generally. So, uh, calculation of the productivity will not have any impact. I mean, it it goes as is as we are all doing so far, taking the actual effort and then calculating the productivity and also other metrics. But the problem that we see is. is it comparable with the existing benchmark that we have the benchmark might be coming from a more of a traditional background and these are very specific type of applications whether it is comparable we don't know and also uh, should we treat this whole set of uh, smaller applications as a different uh, um, altogether uh, different pool of uh, productivity values that is also another open question we would like to conclude this presentation uh with few of the points that we were able to do the fp sizing based on the publicly available documentation and uh, screens uh, screen in images data models architecture diagrams etc uh if we take a completely different category of variable device we may face some more problems or challenges but uh, if pak cpm can be consulted and we can uh, do the fp sizing there snap analysis was very limited because uh, technical data was not available uh, however having a real project maybe we will solve this problem as well uh, we will would like to end this uh, discussion with the comment on the productivity productivity of smaller apps should be studied in isolation and then only we can comment on whether they are comparable with the uh, traditional benchmarks or not isbsg might be interested in taking up this case study and do some analysis around the smaller apps like uh, the apps on the variable devices variable devices with this we are at the end of our presentation now we are open to the questions thanks a lot thank you thanks all okay thank you uh we we have um a comment in the questions it's uh for those interested in automated fp from requirements dash scopemaster.com can be used for counting cosmic and if org if pug and um that's from the author colin hammond um i've it's also not for us. huh it's not for us nadin no, oh not for you <laughs> Wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't know what that. Okay, so Thomas has put one. Thomas Feldman has put one in the um, chat, wondering whether communication between wearables and companion app is not better measured by Cosmic instead of Snap. What's your experience with Cosmic for measuring requirements that originally were NFR? We were expecting. Yeah. on uh, cost uh, related queries and actually we started our uh, paper with a uh, function point if function point and cosmic for these uh, variable devices 
So we started with that, but uh, cosmic and uh, if per function point, both were such a vast topic that we uh, uh, parked them uh, right now, and we uh, took only the if per function point and snap in this. Probably in the future, we'll definitely come up with uh, another version and we'll include the cosmic examples and the cosmic uh, things as well. And I do agree, like we, when we have layered uh, structure, then cosmic uh, is uh, somewhat uh, like uh, taking consideration into ma many other things which probably uh, are missed in function point, but not in snap. Snap can uh, definitely take those things in internal data movement. So uh, uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, thanks for asking. We'll be working on it and probably we'll see another presentation from us uh, on cosmic. Okay. All right. I see a lot of um, great presentation comments coming up in the chat as well. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Thanks for so. that. Thank okay, so now 